thank you for listening to this message from Waynesboro Free Methodist Church. Our mission is to multiply faithful followers of Jesus Christ. We hope this message helps you along your journey. Good morning. Um, I'm Patty Leslie, and I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, John chapter 5, verses 8 through 18, if you'd like to follow along. Get up, Jesus told him. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. He replied, the man who made me well told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who is this man who told you, pick up your mat and walk, they asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Jesus responded to them, My father is still working, and I am working also. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah, thank you, Patty, so much. Oh, my goodness. Guys, uh, first, let me just make a, a quick comment. If I am the ox in that illustration, uh, according to Scripture, uh, I am a well-fed, delightful ox. And I love getting to go out and plow the grounds for you and bring it back from the fields uh, what God has said in his word. So if you haven't turned yet to John 5, you need to be there. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seat back right in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, don't leave today without one. We've got plenty for you. It's full free. So John chapter 5 is where I want you to be. We're going, oh my God, oh, Jesus, please forgive me. We've got, um, we've got this series going through the gospel of John, right? And uh, the Gospel of John, the way we're going through it is through what's called an expositional series. It's basically going verse by verse, passage by passage, which means I'm not determining the next theme or the next topic that we're talking about. God's Word is. And I'm also not the one formulating the sermon. God's Word is the authority over what we talk about and what I say. So that's what we're trying to do. We're elevating the authority of God above all things. We're a Logos-centric church. And so what that means is, like if you were to go back last week and listen to the sermon, you would hear it from the Gospel of John, but it would be all about the story of the man by the, the well, right? Man by the pool, trying to be made well by the pool, and it not working and Jesus comes in and he makes him whole, right? Incredible, miraculous story, right? We also, if you were to go back two weeks ago, it'd be a totally different topic. We talked about faith, the kind of faith that Jesus asks of us. This about, there's a story about the royal official whose son was dying down in Capernaum and needed Jesus to come down. Jesus says, your son will be well. And the father demonstrated the kind of faith that Jesus asks of us, the kind of faith that believes in the word and obeys in the wait. That was your part, church. <laughs> Obeys in the wait, right? So this week, we're on a totally different topic. This week, we're dealing with the topic about morality and authority. Morality and authority. In other words, we're dealing with issues of what are right and wrong, and who is it that has the authority to determine what is right and wrong? Who is it that bears the authority to say, well, this is what's good and this is what's bad. Here's what's really righteous. This is what's wicked. This is broken. This is whole. Who is it that has the authority to do such things? And guys, could you imagine a more important time for us to have that conversation than right now? I mean, don't get me wrong. The issue of morality, what's right and what's wrong, has always been talked about through all of the centuries. But my goodness, could, you, could we agree that in our country now more than ever, We've seen a decline of this. We've seen a decline of the definition of what is right and what is a wrong. And, and, and we've not only seen the decline of it, but a redefining of it. Have we not? 
So why, why, now more than ever, we need to be talking about issues of morality and who has the authority to define morality, to lay out what's right and what's wrong. Because you know what's going on in the world right now? You know what the, the word on the street is about morality? If it feels right, then it is. If it feels right to me, then it is right. I can define right and wrong however I want, is what the world's saying. What's true for you is true for you. And what's true for me is true for me. You can just say back to them, oh, is that true, though? Right? It's the roadrunner thing, right? You keep them going. If it feels right to me, I'm going to do it, is what they say. Guys, if you, I mean, we've already seen this, but if I've, I'm just going to say it. You know where that road leads to? Absolute moral insanity and destruction. It leads to just the most idiotic, crazy, insane things happening in the world. I've got a story that I want to use to illustrate that. Um, how many of you have seen the Netflix documentary called Untold? It's about the Notre Dame linebacker named Manti Teo. You know that story at all? All right, you're, buckle your seatbelts, okay? So um, uh, it's, uh, about a, a decade ago, Manti Teo, he's from Hawaii. He was drafted, he was, he was playing for the Notre Dame firing, Fighting Irish. Whose team is the Notre Dame Fighting Irish? Who likes them? Nobody. Okay, because we're all UVA, right? Yeah. Just kidding. Nope, Virginia, I just, ah, uh, this is a house divided, Virginia Tech, UVA, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> NC State. Yeah, Wolfpack. Yeah. I was like, what are you doing? I should know this, right? Anyways, squirrel moment. So let's get back. Manti Teo was a star linebacker for the Fighting uh, Irish, right? And his senior year back in like, I think it was like 2013, uh, the, the year starts out, right? And they're projected to be really good. One day, in, in one day, Manti Teo's girlfriend and grandma both died. And it was a, it was a crushing story. Like, and a lot of people rallied around Manti Teo, and, and, and at the beginning of the season, he dedicated his season to them, right? And he had a phenomenal year, just an incredible player, right? And he went on to be nominated for the Heisman Trophy. They, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish had an undefeated season, regular season, and they went on to win the national title. Just an incredible year for the Fighting Irish, and an incredible year for Teo. Well, after the games... Something came out into public knowledge. It turns out that not only did Teo's girlfriend die, she never actually existed. The person Teo thought he was dating was a, a, a person, an online person named Lene Kikua. And it turns out that she was an online fabrication. Teo had never met Kikua in person, right? Never met her in person. They met online. And, and they, they started dating online. He met her via social media. They would have phone calls. How that happened, don't know. Uh, they had texts. They, they, uh, they, he, start, he was dating her over the online platforms, and, and yet she wasn't even real. Lene, the, this girlfriend, was a fake online persona created by a man named Ronaya Tuayosop. Sopa, I nailed it. A burly Samoan former high school football star who now identifies as a transgender woman. Manti Teo had been what is called catfished. And you know what? The world said, oh, it's okay. It's okay that happened. It had to. It had to in order to stay logically consistent. You know why? Because if right now, if my gender identity can be disembodied from the, my embodied identity, then why can't my online identity be disconnected from my embodied identity? Moral issues and insanity, right? Like, how insane is it that Manti Teo's dating some fake woman, right, who's actually a man, 
And you know what his reasons were? This is actually, he said what his reasoning was. Ronaniah's reasoning, he said, it is what made me happy. It was what I wanted to be reality. And so he said, it felt good, and so I did it. And it led to the destruction of Mantiteo's joy and his football career. Guys, it's just insane. And it starts with that simple idea that we get to define what is right and what is wrong. And Jesus today in this text is going to directly confront that idea, not in speech, but in his action. And we're going to study that in his word today. So uh, you can already remember the story that we read at the start of this, right? Jesus just approached this invalid who was paralyzed for 38 years. He had been by the well attempting to make himself whole, but it never worked. It didn't work for him. And finally, Jesus just says, do you want to be well? And, and then makes him well, right? Makes him entirely well. 38 years, a paralyzed man, and now he's miraculously healed. What an incredible testimony of Jesus' power. And so like this is supposed to be an incredible thing. Like, like oh my goodness, this is the movie scene in the, in the movie, right? Where the music starts to play, the sky opens up, a rainbow breaks through, birds fly in and start tweeting and chirping, and then baby deer and bunnies start coming in and singing the hallelujah chorus, right? And then, and then the, the, there's, there's little gold fleckles falling all over the place, right? Like it's just that scene. And then verse 9. Now that day was the Sabbath. The music scratches to a stop, right? The birds start flying away. The wind picks up. The deer and bunnies say, dun, dun, dun. And the music shifts to this really powerful minor discord. And the ominous clouds roll back in. It's like, uh uh-oh. The dark side of this story gets introduced It was the Sabbath. Now, just so we're all on the same page, we got to know what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath was one of the most precious treasures in Jewish culture and history. One day a week, it was commanded of the whole nation that everyone rest, that everyone not do work. Something that we've lost something that we as Christians have especially forgotten about or not to, like we just heard it said, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember it. Like, well, well, have we been doing that? No, probably not, right? Something that we as Christians have forgotten the beauty of, the Sabbath, right? Guys, recent research has discovered, I say discovered, that refraining from working one day out of the week has massive correlations to mental and physical health improvements. Just resting one day a week, not actually doing much work on that day, has massive implications for your mental health and physical health. Science discovered it. (laughs) You know, I love how science is just always keeping up with what God has already said to be true. It's like they're discovering things that God's like, (laughs) scientists come up, hey, look what we've discovered, look what we found out, and Christians sitting back like, Yeah, man, I mean, God kind of put that in millennia ago. Glad you found it. Good for you, right? Like, way to go. You made something, right? It's ridiculous. Like, the Sabbath is an incredible blessing, and it's that day that Jesus heals this man. And so the Jewish leaders here, right, there are Jewish leaders. They're in the colonnades. They're among these invalids. They're among the multitude of the sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed, and and they see someone. They're, they're, they're there every day, right? It's part of their job. They're supposed to be ministering unto them and caring for them. And as they're building relationships with these people in this colonnade, in this area, uh, they, they see, they see brother, brother Chris get up. And he's walking. Like, we know Chris. He was, he's been here for 38 years. Like, what's he doing walking? Like, they're shocked. They see this guy walking. And you know what they do? What do they go up and say to him? They go up and they say, well, no way, man, you're walking? My goodness, what happened to you? Wait, have you been playing a prank for 38 years? That's just a terrible, that didn't work out for you. We're the ones who won in that. You lost in that if that's what you think a good prank is, right? Like, wait, wait, so you're saying you were healed? You were healed? Man, praise God, who healed you? We need to go find him. He has incredible power. Is that what they said? 
No. What did they see? They saw their Sabbath laws being broken. Their Sabbath laws being broken. Like, I'm just going to say this. (laughs) How dull do you have to be? (laughs) Like, how dull? Like, this guy's been paralyzed for 38 years, and all of a sudden, he can walk. He's not supposed to be carrying his mat. Like, they didn't care a lick about the miraculous, impossible work that Jesus had just done. All they cared about was their law-keeping. I mean, they, did, they think they saw what is important. They thought they saw what was important, but they didn't care about the well-being of people. They cared about their rules and their traditions. I mean, the Jews are looking at this miraculously healed man and only seeing an outward behavior that didn't align with their laws, and they confront him. You see, without Jesus, all some people can offer you is behavior modification and law-keeping. That's not what we offer here. We don't offer a set of morals for you to live by alone. That's part of what it means to follow Jesus, but that's not what we offer. You see, we offer more. All the Jews could offer him was law-keeping and behavior modification. They couldn't change his inside at all. They were powerless to do anything that had any lasting eternal implications on his life. All they could really do was work hard to manipulate the outside of his life. And Jesus comes in and radically reshapes him and makes him whole inwardly and outwardly. And when Jesus does this, those who care most about behavior modification confront those whose behaviors don't align with their rules and ignore completely the impossible transformation that has happened in that person's life. So they say to this man in verse 10, look at verse 10. They say, this is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. And what does the healed man do? He pulls what Eve did, what Adam did. Oh, it wasn't me who did this. It was the the guy who healed me who told me to do this, right? He shifts the blame. And now the Jews are just angry because there's some rogue guy going on around people telling them that they can break the law. There's someone telling people they can break the law. Who is he? We have to find him. Not because of his power, but because he's breaking the law. Now, just a quick obvious question, uh, and the answer is no. Would Jesus, who is equal with God, co-eternal with the Father, the author of all moral law given in the Old Testament, would he have ever commanded someone to break the law that he penned with his voice? Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Why did I say welcome? Anyways, all right. No, of course not. He would not have broken his own law. So then what's happening here? Like, why is this man being accused of breaking the law, and why is Jesus being accused of breaking the law? What law was he breaking? Well, so let's get to some of the things that are going on in the Old Testament. So there was a Sabbath law, right, that pretty much forbid doing work. Right? That, I mean, that's the basic command for the Sabbath. Do not work on the Sabbath day. Don't work. Well, then you have to ask, well, what does work mean? Right? The clearest conclusion that we can probably get to is just simply employment. Like what you do 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Some of you do it Saturday, right? Some of you do it Sunday. Some of you have to, right? What you're doing Monday through Friday for employment, don't do one day a week basically the gist of it. Find one day where you're not doing that. So, like, unless this guy here worked for the local mattress warehouse and was, like, moving furniture for the invalids, he wasn't breaking the Sabbath law of not working because it wasn't his job to do that. It wasn't his employment. It's not how he made money. So we've really got to figure out what's going on here. Why is this something for them? So the Jewish rabbis for many years 
had passed on from one generation to the next something that they called the oral law. The oral law, which was later written down into something called the Mishnah. Right? So this was something that concerned the Sabbath. They were concerning the Sabbath. They had analyzed and broken down the Sabbath prohibition into 39 different classes of work, which included taking and car- or carrying anything from one domain to another. In other words, carrying this to the next room. Can't do it on the Sabbath. So in other words, this guy wasn't breaking an Old Testament law. He was breaking the laws the Jewish leaders had formulated for holiness. So like now the Jews' zeal for law-keeping takes on an entirely different meaning. you got to think about that, right? Because their concern wasn't with whether or not these individuals were keeping God's law. Their concern was whether or not they were keeping their laws, their understanding of morality. So like Jesus hasn't broken the law with his own uh, actions that he wrote with his own hands. No, he broke the law men had penned, right? Men who had elevated themselves to the position of a lawgiver, making their own laws, calling out failures to keep their laws, and seeking to preserve the sanctity of their laws. So they were, they were most concerned about whether or not their laws were being kept, ones that they had wrote, written, ones that they had formulated. Um, don't we do this too? Aren't there ways that we do this in the church? As there's, there's ways that we in the church can elevate ourselves to the position of law keeper keeper and 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 formulate laws about how we should interact with one another that aren't explicitly commanded in scripture so here's an example and i want to tread carefully here like there's ways that we condemn someone for drinking alcohol in safe moderation right There's laws in certain sects of Christianity that says that someone has to say 20 Hail Marys before they can be forgiven for their sin. There's certain laws in certain churches that say you can only use the KJV Bible translation because, you know, that's the one that Paul wrote, right? I don't know if my generation remembers this book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. That was the Christian thing, right? The, it was a book that condemned uh, dating and said that the Christian way to do it was courtship, right? Making a new moral law of how to engage one another. Or I think, I think um, one that I think is most easily felt and entertained is having a particular dress code for when we come together on Sunday mornings. A certain dress code, like you have to have, you got to dress your best for Jesus, right? Like, I'll just say it this way. One time I, I, um, I came to church wearing, I've got, I've got a pair of, of black shoes that are called, they're kind of like Chucks, right? Old school Converse's kind of felt cool in them. <laughs> Didn't feel so cool after I got the comment once when I came to church one morning and was approached and said, you're wearing chucks to preach in? Shame on you. I said, God, I'm sorry if my chucks are going to hinder this being preached. <laughs> like, we can so easily create our own rules, right? Rules for morality, and, and we can enforce them upon others. Guys, I don't think that we realize that Really what we're doing when we do that is arrogantly elevating ourselves to the position of lawgiver. When we fashion together what might be considered in categories of wisdom, but make them moral rights or wrongs. So like what I'm about to tell you I think is the first step that's really important for us to agree with. And it's simply this, we do not have authority over morality. Can we say that together? One, two, three. We do not have authority over morality. 
We just, we just don't have that kind of authority. We don't have the authority to create laws. I'm not saying that we don't have the authority in this public sphere, in the, in the horizontal domain, to enforce God-given moral laws for other people to find life through. Right? That's not what I'm arguing, but we don't have the authority to create laws, to say what is right and what is wrong out of our own thoughts, no matter what our society is telling us. So like our society right now is driven by the morality, the moral standard that says if it feels right, then it is right. And that is what we as Christians or even socialists would say. That's moral individualism. Moral individualism. And basically that means the individual gets to define what is right and wrong and what governs them. Now, if that's the case, if that's what's true, that you individually have the right to define what is right and wrong, then it's just a really, really short road. Actually, it's just one step to moral relativism. Moral relativism is the idea that there are no moral absolutes. In other words, murder could be wrong in one area and right in another. Now, somebody wouldn't admit that, but that's literally the logic that follows. Moral relativism, which means right and wrong, is no longer a standard across humanity. But it's what you make it to be for yourself. What's true for you is true for you. Literally, is what that means. So what these Jews are doing, they're trying to preserve among themselves and among the generations a morality that they believed was godly, but ultimately was fashioned in their own domain of authority, in their own hearts and in their own minds. So in comes Jesus And he just totally ruins their morality standards concerning the Sabbath. And verse 16 says that they hated him for this. In fact, verse 16, in the way it says it, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. These things implying that this was happening several times, that he was doing certain works on the Sabbath that were going against their laws, and they hate him for it. They began to persecute him for it. And so finally, Jesus in verse 17, he goes up and he talks to them. He finally says in verse 17, look, he says, my father is working until now and I am working. So let me just give you the easy translation or the paraphrase. God, who is my dad, is working on the Sabbath and I am too. Now here's the logic behind that. Here's, here's what he's ultimately logicing or offering as logic for us to consider. And I'm going to ask a question. Again, the answer is no. Does God actually stop doing everything on the Sabbath? No, No, he doesn't. I hope you actually said that, not because I said it was the answer, but because you actually understand that. Here's why. If if you think yes, then uh, I'm not sure you understand how important God's sovereignty is over all of creation. So at every second... In every day, God is holding all of the created order together. Everything, every metric, every uh, design in the created order is sustained in its place because God is holding all things together. Colossians 1.17, and in him all things are held together. Which means... That the trillions of stars in the night sky, located and found in the billions of galaxies, are all held in their place because God is holding them there at this very moment. The molecular bonds between two atoms of oxygen that forms the air that we breathe, God holds those molecular bonds together in every second. And right now, he is maintaining, he's instituted and is maintaining the perfectly defined metric for gravity that's keeping us on this earth. So if God were to stop all work on the Sabbath, what would happen? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, you know those movie scenes where you have the celebrity person walking away from everything exploding? That's pretty much what had happened. God's walking away from explosion after explosion, right? Like literally, uh, it, it, like we'd fly off into space, uh, oxygen would fall apart, and galaxies would collapse. Oh boy. Praise 
God that he is not subject to the laws of man. That he doesn't accept the laws that we make about morality. No, he keeps working on the Sabbath in a life-sustaining, universe-upholding way. And if God is working on the Sabbath in a life-sustaining way, then Jesus is too. Because Jesus is His Son. Jesus refuses to be constrained by the moral standards that the Jews had set. No, He's on a totally different level of authority here. And that's exactly where we're going to be going next. Look at verse 18. This is how we're going to wrap things up. Verse 18. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill Jesus. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath in their eyes, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal to God. You know how Scripture sometimes says that Jesus never called himself God? Like he never declared himself to be God? Well, he said things that made people believe that he was equal with God. So there's an apology there. But What Jesus said in verse 17, right, back before this, my father is still working and I am working also, communicates to the Jewish leaders that he was making himself out to be equal with God. So they weren't angry just for his Sabbath law breaking. They thought he was committing blasphemy as well, unless what he was saying is true. So Jesus wasn't making himself out to be another God or a competing God, but being as the same with God, who has all authority, who isn't constrained by our standards of morality, but has authority to calibrate our morality. So Jesus is equal with God, the lawgiver, the giver of all moral standard. And that's how we're going to actually like take something away from this text like if there's going to be a truth that we're really going to hone in on it's going to be simply revolving around this like Jesus wasn't willing to mold himself to the morality of the Jewish leaders that they had crafted in their ignorance instead Jesus was working in his ministry to calibrate ours to calibrate our standard of morality. So like that's a big part of Jesus' ministry, is it not? Telling us the things that are right and the things that are wrong, the things that are good and beautiful, the things that are wicked and broken. Even if it meant that he was contradicting the Jewish leaders of the day. So like for example, in Matthew 5, we hear over and over again, you have heard it said this, but it's this, right? So, so it's not just murder, it's hatred in the heart. It says it's not just adultery, it's lust within. It's, it's not just stealing, it's envy. It's not just boasting, it's pride. So he's confronting and calibrating morality all his ministry. He's even here, like, which matters more? Doing work on the Sabbath or healing and forgiving sin? Not doing work on the Sabbath or healing and forgiving sin. Jesus contested the standards of morality in his day throughout his whole ministry. It just, it's just what he did. But here's the thing. If Jesus was just another man, his contestations would mean diddly squat. He's just another man. Man has always contested morality throughout history. What's right and what's wrong. There were things that were wrong a few centuries ago that are now right. There are things that were right a few centuries ago that are now wrong. Man has constantly debated. If Jesus was just another man, what difference does it make? But that's why verse 18 in this context is such a huge deal because he wasn't just another man. Jesus was and is God. And God has all authority as the lawgiver, to be the lawgiver. So, here's the main truth that I think we need to take away today. Jesus has authority to calibrate our morality because of his equality. Can we say that together? One, two, three. Jesus has authority to calibrate our morality because of his equality. So, like, if Jesus wasn't fully God, then... No pressure, right? No pressure to try to work what you understand is right and wrong to what Jesus said is right and wrong. No, no pressure. You don't need to worry about it because he's just another man, right? 
But if you and I agree that Jesus is God, co-eternal with the Father, that the fullness of deity dwelled bodily in Jesus, then you and I have to, and I mean yes, have to allow Jesus his rightful place in our lives over our morality. That he has the authority to come in and calibrate what we say is right and what we say is wrong because he has equal authority with God. So like we don't, as Christians, define our morality anymore. We discover it in God's word and we issue it out and we live it out. Jesus does the defining. So can I just say, like, Ain't that a huge relief? Like, isn't that a huge burden off of us? Guys, studies show that more people today, especially in my generation and younger, this will surprise you, they want to believe that morality is a standard that's given to us. They want to. And Jesus is the answer. Jesus alone answers what our world is truly craving. One who has all authority to calibrate morality across generations and whole societies of humanity. So when you and I, when we come to Jesus, when we claim to carry the banner of the Son of God, we must allow Him in to what we believe to be right and what we believe to be wrong, to calibrate it to His standards rather than accepting what the culture says is right and wrong. So the question is, will we be a church? Will we continue to be a church that accepts Jesus' standards of morality in every area of life? Whether it's issues of sexuality and identity, or whether it's tax evasion, or alcohol consumption, or marriage, or divorce, Will we be that church and will we continue to be a church that elevates Jesus' standards of morality over all spheres of humanity because we're believing that Jesus has the authority to calibrate our morality in every category of humanity because of his equality with God? So, two quick ways that this lands for you and me. This belief, this concept that Jesus has this kind of authority to do this. Two ways that this lands. The first, since you and I don't have the authority to define morality or redefine morality, then don't create or enforce moral laws that Jesus didn't. Just don't, right? So so this isn't a new issue. This is one that is addressed elsewhere in Scripture. Romans talks about issues of disagreement, issues... Uh, that, that can be disagreeable uh, among other issues. Uh, Colossians 2, Paul writes this. Let me just put it up on the screen. It says, If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Why do you submit to regulations, laws? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are, what does it say? Human commands and doctrine not God-given commands and doctrine. Although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. They just don't work. So ways that this can kind of flesh itself out in our local body as believers, I'm going to mention a few, and I say this all in love, and I want to celebrate some things as I do. Uh, Again, I, I mentioned it earlier, apparently I've got a lot of pain here, the law of Sunday's best, so you dress your best, right? Like, can we just, can we just say that, that that's not commanded in Scripture? That I've got to come here dressed in a suit and tie to the nines, right, just to impress God with my ability to look nice? What does God care about most? Issues of the heart. And so, so I would just encourage us to be, be weary of saying, well, that person's not dressed nice enough to belong here. Clearly, they don't belong it can do a lot of damage to somebody who thinks that they're supposed to be accepted in here when in reality they don't even have enough money to make a wardrobe that fits your rules. So don't don't, don't hurt people that way with laws that we've fashioned together. I'd rather you dress your heart for Jesus than your body. Though please come with clothes on. (laughs) Another one, real quick. 
and, and I, again, I, I'm trying to speak truth in love, um, the law that churches should only sing hymns when they get together is not in Scripture. So, don't get me wrong, my favorite songs to sing are hymns. I love the old and the new hymns. Um, and so we're going to keep singing them all the live long day. We're going to sing them here until our, we all die, right? But, but, but that also means that because it's not commanded in Scripture that we only sing hymns, we will work to incorporate songs of worship from every generation because we love and are going after every generation. Can we agree with that? Uh, we don't have to, yeah. The third thing, just real quick, other ways, like uh, uh, rules about not being able to play cards, right? Or, or not having a glass of wine with dinner. They're not in Scripture. Now, should you know what gambling is and whether or not God celebrates it? Absolutely. You should know whether or not it's wrong or right. Should you know what's wrong when you have too much alcohol? Absolutely. And you should not indulge in it. But don't create additional rules. A general rule of thumb if it's not commanded in Scripture explicitly, don't enforce it as morality. Now, again, I'm not saying that there's not conversations about wisdom, especially about alcohol. If you're prone to addiction and you need to abstain, praise God for that wisdom, right? And we'll support you in that, right? There's, this, there's a lot more conversation to be had. You don't have time, nor do I, but the reality is just if it's not explicitly commanded in Scripture, don't declare it as a moral issue. Talk about it in wisdom and love and be okay with disagreeing with some people sometimes. But keep love. That's the first way I think that this can land according to this passage. The second way that I think that this can land is that I want to encourage you to relentlessly pursue the calibration of your morality to Jesus' standard. Don't just ignore this. Don't just think, oh, this is a really boring topic and a really boring sermon. I'm just going to go home and do whatever I want, right? Like, that's not it. Relentlessly pursue this. And here's why, uh, from a personal example. Uh, for many, many years, there was a habit of sin that I kept in my life because it was one that I really enjoyed. And it's a really personal one, and so it would be inappropriate for me to go into details, but I, it was one that I enjoyed. And it was one that I wasn't really sure whether it was right or wrong. And I didn't want to do the work of finding out if it was right or wrong because I loved it too much. And it turns out it's a wicked thing. Don't let yourself stay in ignorance over a moral issue just so you can keep that sin. Don't let yourself hold on to it, right? Don't plead ignorance. Don't just simply say, well, I'm not sure if it's right or wrong and stay there. No, 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 no. Don't settle for that. Don't be content not knowing, especially so you can keep doing what feels good to you or what puts food on the table, right? Like whatever reason you have. No, no, no. Study the book. Study God's word. Pray and ask for God's truth to be implanted deep in your heart. Seek counsel about issues that you don't know about. Read really good books about issues that you don't know about. Guys, Jesus is really eager to calibrate what we believe is right and wrong because in showing you what is right, he's leading you to joy. And in showing you what is wrong, he's defining the battle line for sin and showing you what destroys your soul. Guys, the do's and don'ts of Scripture are for your joy, not to rob you of it. So like how desperately do you long for all that Jesus commanded to be right and wrong, all that God's word says is right and wrong, how desperately do you want that to be tucked into the deepest places of your heart? How desperately do you long for that? Because if we're going to sing together that Jesus is worthy, if we're going to agree that he deserves such a position in our lives, then we're going to have to let him do his work and relentlessly pursue him to do that work. We hope this message helps you multiply faithful followers of Jesus Christ. For more information about our church, please visit waynesboroughfm.com.